Welcome to the Jim Goss Podcast, brought to you by JPS. You're with your hosts, Samuel Skeppis, Jackson Pios, and myself, Jacob Skeppis, where we bring to you what's good in the science of fitness and the latest musings in and around the gym. So this podcast is broken into two segments. The first segment is a roundtable discussion between Jackson, Sam, and myself, with a guest on various fitness topics who will join us each month. The second segment is a Q&A section where we answer any questions you guys ask us, and by any, we mean any. So the podcast is exclusive to the JPS Education Portal, which is our premium content-based subscription service. If you're a portal member, you'll gain access to the full version of these podcasts simply by logging into your portal. You'll also get access to all of our lectures, articles, and practical videos, plus plenty, plenty more if you are a Portal subscriber. And if you do want to join the Portal and revolutionize your fitness game, simply click the link in the description box below and join for just $7.99 Australian per week. For those of you who aren't a Portal subscriber, you will only be able to watch or listen to just half of these episodes, which we will be releasing each month. However, every second month we will release a full episode because we want to spread our love and see. Well, I've already spread mine. I think Sam's up next. Uh, Jackson, well, if he could reproduce with an anime character, I'm sure he'd have uh, plenty of children and be a father of at least five by now. So while we're at it, I'll tell just one more joke. Danny Lamb. I hope you all laughed. Well, that is our first guest, and he is no joke. Uh, he's somebody I really admire and think is fantastic at what he does in both uh, communicating as well as bringing together people uh, in the evidence-based community to help further our understanding of all things nutrition. He is the owner of Sigma Nutrition Coaching Service and the host of Sigma Nutrition Radio. Uh, He's a presenter on the JPS Mentorship and he presented on uh, our module covering evidence-based practice, which is the topic of discussion for today. So in this episode, we discuss, is the evidence-based community dying? Are people using science to sell? What makes someone evidence-based? Is evidence-based fitness really all it's cracked up to be? And can we get results and be successful in fitness without being evidence-based? And we also answer a bunch of hilarious questions um, and some very good questions as well from various uh, people submitting them to us. So if you want to get your questions to us as well and have them answered next month, uh, just stay tuned on social media for Jackson, myself, and Sam, and our guest uh, for the month uh, where you can submit questions to us. So guys, without further ado, uh, let's get stuck into things. I hope you enjoy these podcast episodes, and if you do, please feel free to share them on your social media and tag uh, myself, Jackson, Sam, and our guests, as well as JPS Education or JPS Health and Fitness, because that means the world to us. See you on the flip side. Enjoy. Yeah. All right. Welcome, guys, to the Education Portal. This is our first roundtable chit chat. And on today's uh, table, vir- uh, virtual table, we have uh, myself, Jacob Skeppis, Sam Skeppis, Danny Lennon, and Jackson Pios. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, Danny. All right. And in today's uh, discussion, we are going to talk about the fitness industry, uh, both in terms of the specific subgroup of the fitness industry that we're all active members in, which is the evidence-based fitness community, uh, as well as um, the fitness industry more generally. We're going to kick things off with our current perspectives of uh, evidence-based fitness. So I thought to start this uh, topic, we should have Danny um, discuss what evidence-based practice and evidence-based fitness is he uh, presented a module for the JPS mentorship uh, that was quite detailed and discussed this. Um, so I thought it'd be fitting for you to kick this one off, Danny. Over to you. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try and keep it uh, brief and maybe not put too many spoilers in the, that lecture. Uh, but <laughs> essentially, with evidence-based practice, uh, what the goal is, uh, I suppose, if we're trying to apply this to fitness or nutrition coaching, is that when we are trying to make decisions in order to avoid the typical cognitive biases and uh, pitfalls of the was human mind and thinking we know what is best in order to make the best decisions if we root them in the best current evidence 
we're more likely to approximate to the best starting point with a, a given recommendation. So evidence-based fitness takes into account so there's three aspects of that typically. So we want to look at the best current scientific evidence we can see that has been in published research. And having a good grounding in that, again, is more likely to get us to uh, closer to the truth or something that approximates to uh, a good starting point for someone. Second, we want to layer in the practitioner's expertise and experiences in the past. And so through their work with other clients and uh what they've been able to achieve through their own so practitioner uh, experience is, is useful to layer on top of that, particularly for areas where we maybe have unanswered questions from the literature base. And then we also want to take into account the individual needs, preferences, choices, etc., of an individual client that you may be working with. So sometimes those things may dictate that you end up using an intervention that isn't typically maybe standard of care or isn't what has generally worked within the middle part of a bell curve within certain research group, uh, research studies, or it may just not be something that we actually have adequate literature on right now. So it's kind of those three overlapping ideas um, with the goal being if we can use evidence as a, a foundational uh, cornerstone of making decisions, we're more likely to make better decisions. So gotcha. that was that Perfect. first starting so, point. Yeah, that's a really good starting point. So uh, fundamentally, uh, evidence-based practice is using those three pillars um, to inform um, decisions based on the best available evidence um, so we can minimize risk, improve the probability of attaining whatever outcomes we want, uh, so on and so forth. Now, uh, I know Jackson was the one who wanted to discuss this topic. Um, and I think uh, based on our chats, he's got a few ideas that I want to get uh, out there. Um, so, and I, and I think we will, most of us will agree on this, but do you guys feel like science-based fitness has somewhat been like weaponized by the fitness industry um, and coaches in general um, as a means of marketing and promoting their services, but they're not truly evidence-based based in terms of upholding those three pillars and uh, respecting the scientific process um and everything that evidence space practice stands for jackson what do you think i think yes absolutely um a, a way you can pretty easily tell with like these evidence-based coaches who preach science first is they'll never really go on podcasts um podcasts is where you really get tested out to see what you know on the spot and that's why Danny's a host. Mm. <laughs> yeah, never hide behind. Smart, proper, um, <laughs> But with these evidence-based coaches or, or the pseudo-evidence-based coaches, that they never go on these podcasts because they know that if they really got pressed for how much uh, they know, uh, they'd probably fall apart and, and they'd, they'd get exposed. Um, so I definitely think uh, that that's a pretty common trait with these pseudo evidence-based coaches. And it's very easy to look like, you know, what you're talking about in an IG post where you have an hour to sit down and carefully plan out your caption and pull from resources that are sitting right in front of you. Um, but when you're sort of on the spot, that's a different game. Um, and, and the guys who actually do know what they're talking about, like the, the Eric Helms and co, um, he was the first one that sprung to mind. You, they're, they're very easily and comfortable to, to sit on a podcast and do a random Q&A of anything in the evidence-based fitness community and answer confidently. So um, I definitely think it is a trend um, and it is a shame, um, but I'm still quite confident that these pseudo guys, they, they will get exposed at one stage or another. And the guys who really do know their shit will, will sort of push through. Mm. Yeah, Samuel, do you think that, um, you know, with a lot of the people who come through JPS up and coming coaches who do see, I guess, the utility and value in science, because that's why they're coming to us, because we, you know, try to be evidence based, uh, they want to learn from us through our mentorship, our cert three and fours. Do you think that based on what we've discussed with Danny in terms of actually being evidence based, that a lot of these young coaches do so appreciating that aspect of uh, what we can offer versus just wanting to be a part of the community? Yeah, I think there is a bit of a, like there is a distinction. And I think that's something that <clears throat> the more people, you know, 
uh, become exposed to the types of practitioners that Jackson mentioned, the ones that are, you know, trying to either ground their decision making in, you know, literature in their practice or the individual more so rather than just saying, oh, look, I'm evidence-based, but, you know, acknowledging that they have pitfalls, they have <clears throat> the potential to be wrong and biases and looking to, you know, gain information and insight from other practitioners. Um, I think that is definitely something that kind of lends itself to these up and coming coaches more so. Um, you know, you see a lot of new coaches definitely wanting to promote themselves as evidence-based. I, you know, I read a study, I, you know, do an Instagram post, like just Jackson said, it can be very easy to put some information down, but if you test it on it in a long form or explanatory um, way on the spot where you don't have time to think about it, it's a lot more testing, um, you know, so I think... Mm -hmm you know with martin you know for example who mainly like does a lot of the teaching and educating for these you know up and coming students that we particularly have you know martin's someone who actually reads literature like you know through his own university studies he you know also works at a university um you know will refer out to you know other practitioners where they can get you know or scientists people you know anywhere that they can get more information and kind of challenges their knowledge and tries to educate them to build on their, on that scientific, mm -hmm. you know, base as well as the evidence that they have as a practitioner or through their own learning. Um, so I think there is a bit of a distinction, you know, there are, I, you definitely see it all the time. There's a lot of, you know, new coaches who think that evidence base is a buzzword and just something that you can say I'm evidence based because I you know read an abstract. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. I definitely agree. I think, yeah, we have seen a lot of young coaches uh, look to the evidence-based community and they want to be a part of that community. So, you know, it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. We get a lot of group thinking. Yep, they regurgitate information and there's uh, not a lot of understanding. Uh, rather, they're just reciting facts and whatnot, which can be problematic. Um, but, you know, I think we have to um, be humble and have um you know some empathy towards these young coaches because once upon a time we were probably in the same boat and i think uh, that's where we just need to you know guide them and that's where anyone who might be sitting in uh, the ivory tower you know throwing stones um you know you're probably sitting in a glass house <laughs> rather than um you know somewhere where you can actually criticize and critique young coaches for having a crack um but that brings me to something else i think um danny you probably well, Danny and Jackson are probably best suited towards answering this. When a lot of people are getting into the evidence based community, um, and for us, it probably feels like we're already well entrenched in it. And it's like, Jackson, I know we're going to talk about this in a minute. You feel like it's kind of dying. Um, but on the flip side, given our role at JPS with educating a lot of new personal trainers, up and coming coaches, like they're still all about it. There's a lot of hype in that aspect but then when I, I feel what you're feeling that there's a lot of sort of drop off in like the excitement there's like not a lot of you know um you know i guess big sort of reforms or movement. yeah in, in the industry but anyway so uh one thing i think it's important for people to understand um about the evidence based community science in general um is that it, it is a flawed um, you know, which everything is that's created by humans, a flawed uh, system, right? And the scientific method isn't perfect, um, you know, and we have, uh, you know, we can trace it back to like you know, Galileo and all these kind of things. We're just trying to find better ways to think. Um, but in doing so, we're always, um, you know, going to have blind spots and cognitive misers and you know, even researchers aren't perfect. So Danny, I thought if you could discuss some of the limitations of science that coaches who are wanting to be evidence-based should be aware of, when they're looking to research um, and just some of the, I guess, things that people need to know when they're relying on uh, evidence-based practitioners, um, you know, who are passing on um, information. Mm. Yeah. I think this is an interesting question because it actually ties in a couple of those things that you mentioned a moment ago of first having that degree of, of empathy for people who want to be in, in uh, the evidence-based community. And I think there's sometimes they mistakenly feel a pressure to think they need to start discussing, say, 
primary research because that's just the thing you do. And it just may be a case that right now they don't have the the, the skills or experience of going through research to be able to communicate that properly. So actually in those cases, it would be better to say, look, I am a, an evidence-based coach, but the message I'm going to give out is to tell you about other ideas I've heard people in this um, industry talk about rather than try and give this veneer of here's me discussing a certain research paper, maybe misinterpreting what that means. And now you have a, a, a post that you've made on Instagram. That's not like Chinese accurate. Business. Right. Yeah. You can, you can pick a, a study and take like the conclusion and then make a post about it, but it may not actually be a correct interpretation. Um, and it may not even be a, a consensus position. So I think people need to realize you don't necessarily have to have that pressure of thinking you need to uh, like, or being an evidence-based coach, isn't you going and taking one study and making it into an Instagram post, but actually there's probably better ways to communicate. Um, I, I think, kind of more um, broadly when we think about uh, your, your question on, on science, it's understanding what science is there to do. So science helps us get better decisions because it approximates closer to the truth. So the scientific method isn't there to prove anything and one, and one particular study certainly isn't going to prove anything it's there to disprove certain hypotheses and then over time as we get more and more evidence we can approximate closer and closer to what's likely to be correct and so at any one time what we consider to be um, facts within science are factual but in a kind of a tentative way that they are it's possible to change them exactly so we can change that as new evidence comes in and therefore as a practitioner you can have a, a certain degree of facts you're working with but then you may be made aware of something new new research comes in and now you can modify your position and that's essentially what it probably means to be more of an evidence-based coach as opposed to someone who's entrenched in a certain belief or ideology who does things one certain way regardless of what they're presented with. Um, and I think kind of this has been interesting to see this play out in relation to um, actually some of Jackson's work that he's published uh, in recent times, where that was something pretty novel that was done and kind of shook some assumptions people may have had even within evidence-based circles. And so to see how different people dealt with that kind of gives you a clue of who wanted to change positions based in a light of evidence versus who was more kind of still rooted in belief so um to kind of circle back and actually answer your question i think those shortcomings of science is realizing that any one individual research paper could be flawed like you mentioned one individual researcher could have um biases or whatever but that's not really any pushback against science science when we think of it more broadly is when we have independent groups trying to do studies that over time should hopefully verify different results and what we take as our conclusions is not the conclusion of one research study it's where do we see converging lines of evidence from these different types of evidence that all converge on a uh, an answer that seems most likely to be correct and that's the position we take not kind of fringe ideas that are are not part of that um so that's the first thing that comes to mind, but I don't know if that in any way answered your question. Yeah. yeah, no, I think um a lot of people think that science tells us falsifying things, you know, Karl Popper falsification. People think that by a science scientific study, when you know, it comes out with certain results and conclusions, that it's telling us uh, something, but rather it's more so just moving the needle um you know within the haystack so to speak um based on everything else um that's been you know that research has found on that particular uh topic but i think also um you know when it came to discussing um this with you jackson we're talking about um how you feel there's the i guess less interest or you can you can correct me if i'm, I'm interpreting that wrong but it seems like you think the the hype and hysteria about the evidence-based community slowly uh, dropping off. Um, and I think a lot of these young coaches who are getting into the evidence-based community that we were speaking about earlier, um, you know, might be subject to the survivorship bias, which is basically a logical error where they, you know, think that 
uh, successful coaches, um, you know, now are evidence-based. Therefore, um, you know, that's clouding their judgment and they think that, um, you know, that's what they need to do in order to be successful because it seems like all these coaches who are, you know, being successful online and in person now are, you know, science and evidence-based. Um, but I know you are very aware, as am I, that a lot of successful coaches uh, were not or were less evidence-based um, and in our own little echo chamber, um, that bias doesn't really exist because we sort of, you know, look down on people who aren't evidence-based, but there's a lot of really successful coaches who do good work who aren't as, you know, quote unquote, evidence-based as, you know, what many in that science fitness community would like them to be. Yeah. So I, I think like a lot of people refer to evidence-based fitness as a movement mm -hmm. and, I agree with that. Evidence-based fitness has always been there. Just the adoption of it has changed. For example, like 10 years ago, our fitness and nutrition behaviors were predominantly directed by the guys and girls who looked the best. Really athletes. Of their ed educational base. But over the last sort of decade, we have seen this adoption of evidence-based fitness and people starting to um, pay attention to the studies and then acknowledge the researchers in the trenches um, and, and things like that. And sort of five years ago, uh, when we would do like a post talking about, for example, like carbohydrates not being inherently fattening, that was sort of, sort of earth shattering stuff, you know, um, for a lot of people. And, Nowadays, if you made a similar post, it would sort of it would get a two-second scroll, you know. Now, what I think the problem is, is that research takes a lot of time to do. For example, my diet break study took close to three years from study planning, data collection, analysis, manuscript preparation, preparation and submission for analysis and review and, and uh, peer review. Now, what, what I think has happened is we saw this rapid adoption of evidence-based fitness extremely, extremely quickly where people were just crushing through studies and crushing through podcasts and people were just sort of soaking up as much evidence-based information as they could. Now, the researchers just can't mm. keep up with that pace. Now, I think that there are still plenty of researchers still in the trenches right now doing great research but we're not going to see that for a fair bit of time. And I think we are in a sort of lull period where we've sort of, we've chewed up a lot of the sort of novel evidence-based content and there's not a whole lot of new stuff, especially with guys who have been like us, who have been sort of knee deep in this evidence-based fitness um, for a long time. Like there's just not a whole lot of new exciting things to talk about. Now, people entering the evidence-based fitness community for the first time, they're still gonna, they're still gonna get, they're, they're finding a treasure trove of new information that's gonna change their behaviors and their perspectives. Um, but the adoption, the, the amount of people coming in, I feel is uh, less frequent as it was sort of a few years ago. So I think we're at an interesting- that also, interesting. sorry to cut you off, but I just think this ties in, um, and I'm not sure if, um, you would you thought about it uh, when you were saying all that because i th i think it explains everything quite eloquently the adoption of evidence-based fitness coincided with um the rapid expansion and development of social media and digital technologies communication devices mm -hmm. so we had podcasts as people were you know able to get access now to researchers who were talking on podcasts but we didn't have that before uh, we had blogs and things like that but all of a sudden um, there were so many more avenues for people to communicate science um, and I think that is what led to the rapid sort of explosion and adoption and it seems to have you know teetered off at least you know in the way that we look at it um, Danny what do you think um, being someone who is you know essentially a science communicator um, and doing that for a living nobody really knows what you do besides you know, sit in a basement and kill people and never get caught. We don't know how he does it, guys, but he's still here. And, you know, that's why he's got the long hair. He's been in hiding for a few months. Yep. 
<laughs> the podcast is just a front it's like uh it's it's my equivalent of money laundering it's like my fake business <laughs> um this is just what he uses to clean the cash <laughs> exactly yeah. he gets paid the to kill lucra people lucrative cash-based yeah. business is podcasting yeah and then then i just kind of joke about it because it throws people off the scent it's like oh he's joking about it he wouldn't say it if he's actually doing it you know then people are like, oh, maybe it is true. Um, <laughs> the, the, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't going to kill people. Uh, um, how many people have you actually killed? <laughs> I know we're being recorded. What? My answer is zero. Well, uh, yeah, out. don't answer that. It could become incriminating. Um, no, the question was, do you think that um, the reason that we're seeing this lull, uh, well, if you agree that there has been a lull in, I guess, the movement of scientific, um, the science space community currently um, is because we had that expansion and adoption, which was largely due to the technologies and social media that allow us to communicate it, um, you know, very rapidly mm -hmm. and uh, broadly. And now we haven't had any technological advancements and science, as Jackson said, takes a long time to develop and build so we're just we've got all the good stuff and you know all the sort of novel stuff and now it's just a waiting game and it's like incremental um you know developments that are coming out as opposed to when you go from listening to ifbb pros in you know magazines to evidence-based community it's a you know black and white change it's like mm. you know, revolutionary we're not getting that now because we're already in the thick of it yeah it, well to be honest i never really uh, had thought about it and hadn't been on my radar i find that an interesting idea i think it could be either that i don't have my finger on the pulse of things or it could also be that i think there's a slight difference when we think about say evidence-based fitness or particularly in around bodybuilding body composition change specifically versus where a lot of the conversations over the last couple of years i've ended up be having been having and therefore where a lot of my time spent reading has been maybe in health sciences where it hasn't felt like there's been a let up in that i think it's actually been getting quite a lot better of mm. more of the kind of quacks and pseudoscientists are getting even called out more um in that area which i've seen as good but I, I think industries. it's interesting yeah man it's I'm, I'm well i don't belong in any industry i just drift around don't belong no anywhere me. No. um but it, 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 when, when I do think about then, if we take uh, fitness, bodybuilding, um, physique, and, and the nutrition and training for that, it does make sense to me um, that this idea that Jackson has brought up, given that there, it, because it does seem like a, like a certain amount once you know, is like you kind of have like most of the answers you will need. Um, for example, if you take people competing in bodybuilding now, I think there's, there's some interesting questions that are still open, but I think everyone has almost an exact blueprint of like how to get absolutely shredded on, on stage, um, without like predictably. So if they give themselves enough time frame and do things in appropriate manner, work with an, uh, an evidence-based coach, uh, it, it's kind of like being, that seems to have been mapped out is my sense of it. So that kind of makes sense that if people are looking for new and novel in information, maybe they're maybe getting it a bit disillusioned, but um, I don't actually know is the answer. I, I, I don't know, um, but I find it interesting. And have you noticed any sort of like change in like the views that you're getting per podcast or something like has there been any ch change in the trends there or has it been pretty consistent all the way through uh it's been pretty consistently growing which is um so i haven't noticed any uh say say dips or, or backward turn over the last few years um i but i i, I do think it's i think that the change that i've seen is actually another aspect you alluded to of people that are even getting involved with science-based or evidence-based uh, fitness there's very much a different appetite for how much to learn and and information to consume um, and just what the trajectory of a career may be so i think a number of years ago it was quite typical for people to get in this find it fascinating and just want to learn as much as possible and then 
um, just trying to apply that uh, through their coaching. Whereas I think now, just because of the world generally, there's much more of a desire for people, I suppose, to become influencers or um, big yeah. social media accounts, even without doing any coaching. And that's completely fine if someone wants to do that as their career. But I think sometimes it's being done we don't judge you with that, the... What? What's that? We don't judge Jackson for just wanting to be an influencer and not actually coach or train people. Go to a study, Jacob, you're a bum. No, but in the sense of, I think people want to get to that point where they see people who are at, at the top of, of that um, industry uh, without maybe having to do the steps in between of mm. having to do a deep study on something to the point where they actually have something useful to say. And I think that's where you end up getting at, like what Jackson said at the very start of people who maybe couldn't have a conversation in long form about a topic, but will put out a uh, very confident Instagram post on something uh, yeah. to show how much they know. But it may just be surface level knowledge. It may just be taking directly ideas they heard someone else talk about and maybe not even attribute that to them. And so I think there, there's more of a propensity, I think, for that. Um, than maybe there was a few years ago where it were kind of it was I, I don't know there, it, it just felt like it was more natural just to kind of go and do more long form study I guess but mm. I, I, don't I don't know but I guess I want to yeah I think Sam and I are kind of in the thick of it whereas you guys probably don't have as much direct contact with these like younger coaches who are coming up Jackson I'm sure you coach a few Danny I'm sure you know, you probably never killed a few. Yeah. Like just I, I, I don't see other human beings. <laughs> you can tell that's why you're translucent. Your hair's so long. <laughs> like, you know, no sunlight. But like, get some vitamin D. Don't you study health or some shit? Um, Man, we don't have vitamin D here. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. um, so Sam and I, I think Sam and I see a lot of these coaches. And do you think, Sam, that most of them, are more interested in the image that they are going to portray to, um, you know, prospective clients, um, you know, business partnerships they might acquire, whatever it might be, um, than actually understanding. It's like they only want to understand or as a means to an end to get this social profile as opposed to when you and I, Jackson, got into the industry and Sam and Danny, when we all started, we wanted to understand to actually better our knowledge um, to produce you know, more actually, results and to get goals we want. Yeah, I agree. So I think that because of the amount of, like I would say particularly for like JPS, the amount of probably credit, not to toot our own horn, we would get for being say, you know, evidence-based. I think if anything, that's, that probably motivates these new coaches coming through at least our door um, yeah. to be more like, us and actually see the value in trying to be evidence-based for the benefit of the client and the people that they're working with rather than just as a you know marketing ploy or just for kind of that you know more surface level or image-based um, benefits like I, I actually think that you know a lot of the coaches we have you know Luke Twyford comes to mind you know someone who is genuinely out there to be better and to learn for the betterment of their own you know coaching abilities and practice and at the end of the day for the client um, that they're working with so I definitely think there are coaches out there who aren't as genuine in their want to be evidence-based and I think that like Danny said you know pretty well there's you know heaps of coaches kind of touting or they'll like reshare and they'll make posts and they'll talk about these topics as if they know heaps and heaps about it. And, you know, we've all done it. Like, you know, ever, who, who hasn't, you know, probably at some point throughout their career, you know, said something really confidently that they've, you know, probably laid it down the track, you know, gone back on or changed their viewpoint on. But I, I think that is part of being evidence-based at the end of the day. And that is part of the journey. Like as long as you're not, yeah, saying anything so bold. I think a lot of the thing. there's so much good information out there these days. I think when people find, you know, sources that they feel confident 
in that they can trust. You know, there'd be people out there who should reshare Jackson's uh, content and information and they probably don't know, they probably haven't read the full study and they probably don't know everything, but they'll share it feeling confident in the fact that Jackson's reliable and Jackson's trustworthy worthy as, you know, a scientist within the evidence-based community. Um, I don't think they probably didn't read the whole like graphic or caption. Like that's the yeah, crazy but, thing. Like a lot of the time, you know, these people are doing it without even reading the whole caption. Because I, you know, I've questioned people like, you know, who I'm working with in some capacity, whether it's mentoring or whatever. And they might reshare something. I'll be like, oh, did you, you know, find that interesting in the paper? You know, the, the, the this, you know, group two that did this, that, yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, I'm like, well you know, like, did you not look into? And I think that ties into your point, Sam, is that I feel social media and the ideals that a lot of young coaches, some, some of them possess, it's like there's exceptions to every rule. And I'm just speaking generally. I don't think, I think we're lucky. I think we get, you know, the cream of the crop in terms of, you know, uh, future uh, fitness practitioners, but um, they don't actually get to work through the Dunning-Kruger effect because their ideals uh, prevent them from actually learning any further and, and they stop once, you know, they start attaining, you know, that gratification of, um, you know, people following them, likes and whatever. It's like, that's where the reward is. They don't need to go and learn more to be better. They just need to produce better content. And then they, they, they find this like system or formula that allows them to create a certain type of content that works, but that's not actually improving their understanding of the topic. So they don't actually realize that, what we had to do was, oh, you know, I'm shit hot, you know, overconfident in what we, you know, say and think we fake it till we make it. And then we, you know, continue to learn I'm like, oh crap, I don't know what I'm doing. And we go through that whole um, Dunning-Kruger, you know, cycle. But I think what could potentially be the case for a lot of these young coaches, because social media is such a powerful um, vehicle for marketing and sales um, and creating a career. Like it really is. It is a career for a lot of people. They, um, focus so much on that that they don't actually, which they have to by virtue of actually paying their bills and making a living, that they don't actually have to go through the process of learning unless it's through an undergraduate or something like that. Um, and, and I'm speaking, you know, from my own biases, we're talking about, you know, coaches in the industry, not necessarily researchers per se. We're, we're talking about the people who are going to, you know, get their qualifications to be a personal trainer. Um, Sammy, you had your hand up. Sorry, I just had to get that yes. out before. I, I just feel it. like um, I'll s summarize my perspective. I feel like people feel like they need to know everything. And I think that's something everyone probably here will agree. Like new people, like new in the industry, they feel that in order to stand out or yeah. to compete in the industry, that they have to be able to have an answer for everything. They have to know everything. Um, and that's where they probably become, you know, they spread themselves really thin rather than, you know, say really thin, they become a coach who has an Instagram post for every topic rather than becoming a specialist like Jackson who goes, I'm someone who wants to know everything about this, like one kind of topic and going deeper. And I think over time coaches, as they become, you know, or evidence-based practitioners, as they become more advanced in the industry, they, their general knowledge gets it maybe a little bit deeper and it becomes a little bit better. But then instead of, you know, saying any one thing really confidently about something that they're not really, you know, they haven't dug super deep on, they would then, you know, as virtue of time, have resources, you know, either it's like, you know, websites, you know, blogs, podcasts, you know, people on social media who that they go, this is a person you can get more information. And it's kind of like that science communication at a point. That's like where the evidence-based kind of practice ends up going. If you're not actually a, a scientist, you know, in a lab doing research, you know, you're, you're just, you know, consuming it. And you'll never know everything unless you're, you know, digging deep, like, you know, someone like Jackson. That's what I think. I think the new coaches just feel like they need to compete and they need to know everything, which they don't. So that you think they're trying to play a game that isn't the no, game I they feel, should be playing? No, I Yeah, I feel like, I feel like to, to, to sorry. I was just going to jump in and say, like, I, I agree with, with what you said there, Sam, like, I made a decision very early on when I was coming through exercise physiology that I wasn't going to try and spread myself thin really? across nutrition. 
I was like, I'm not going to try and become a jack of all trades here. And I, I, I've yeah. admitted this to Jacob, I've admitted this to you, and I admit it to my clients. It's, if you want super optimized, periodized programs and, and things like that, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Like I haven't gone deep enough to consider myself yeah. an expert in those methodologies. So I don't pretend to be one. I, I, I've made that decision quite early on that I was going to go deep on nutrition and just try and master that thing instead of being like okay at everything, you know? Yeah. Danny, and I, think- I know that you probably, I feel like, sorry, Sam, I just want to no, okay. talk about that because I think that's a really important point from a career perspective um, for anyone, I mean, any industry, um, but relevant to this. And I, I'm, I'm sure Danny will be familiar with what I'm going to um, discuss, whether to generalize or specialize early in your career, Danny. What do you think and what would your advice be to young coaches? Well, I don't know if I should be giving business advice to anyone. I think probably most commonly I, I would have heard people say... Don't lie to me. Uh, maybe, frame it, maybe frame it about understanding something. Yeah. As opposed yeah. To, no, no I, I, I do have an answer to this. Uh, I, I think... He's, most, he's, ha- he's so happy about it too. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most commonly, I think you will hear the idea that if you can um, go down into a specific kind of niche and go deep and be known then for being the best at that thing, Jackson that's Lyman. probably the best uh, long-term strategy. And there's a number of people that um, do that really well. Um, the reason why I probably can't speak to it that much is because I've kind of fell into doing the opposite of where I just end up doing all sorts of things in different areas of nutrition that I talk about. Uh, and and there's been a couple of those where I've seen that gained specific traction at certain points that then end up being really useful uh, for, for business. So uh, like over the last couple of years, a lot of the chrono nutrition stuff, people kind of get you known for talking about that. And that leads to certain things. A couple of years before that, when I wrote the MMA uh, nutrition and cutting guide, then that was the big thing for a while. But generally i've ended up talking about all sorts of different um nutrition topics and i think it's just a, a different type of strategy um yeah. and and there's a there's a, a quote i a, a guy eric weinstein eric weinstein uh said eric. before and uh he said um jack of all trades master of master none, of none. Uh, mm-hmm. master of one trade connector of none and so it's like you can kind of pick between those. And so mine is probably more likely the connector of these different ideas, because again, I'm uh, not the person in any one of these areas. Um, but I think there's plenty of really good ideas of if there is an area you're most interested in, if you niche down into that, you're going to do really well. Um, one example actually in question. Australia. Sorry, can I just ask a serious question? Did you use this strategy as a bit of a, a linchpin that when you started becoming a serial killer, just be really hard to pin you down something? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, all of my decisions are based on that. You know? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I, I think to, to give a good example of then the, the opposite, uh, in Australia, if you look at Jordan Sullivan, who people may have seen as the fight dietitian, he basically is like, I'm only going to talk about MMA nutrition and weight cutting and only work with those people and that's it and every post podcast coaching client i have is in this specific area and then obviously not everyone can do that but when you are as good and as competent you can uh, do that so i think um yeah there's certainly value in in going deep uh, for one thing i think certainly from a, a coaching perspective for me it's a bit different because um from I suppose in some ways I've done the one particular thing of being like known for a nutrition science podcast. Um, but from a coaching perspective, I don't know too many people that, that when they're seeking out uh, maybe a new coach wants to go to the person who says they work with every single type of potential demographic rather than saying, I'm the best at working with these types of people. Um, I don't, I, I don't think that's ever been the case really. So from coaching I think, yeah, if you have one specific demographic, it seems like there's a topic, you're better. It seems like there's levels to, uh, or at least layers to the generalization, specialization. So it like starts with your niche, 
whether you generalize or specialize, then even within each specific niche, then there's a level of specialization, generalization as to what you're doing with that niche. Are you doing nutrition only? Are you doing training only? Are you biomechanics? Are you understanding psychology, lifestyle? You know, like there's it's so many different layers. I think that's the complexity of personal training in general is it, it it's a, you know, brings in so many different domains of science that, um, you know, to be actually really good personal trainer across the board, even if you have a specific niche, like Jackson, you have a specific niche, it's mostly, you know, physique enthusiasts, body composition, fat loss, muscle gain, right? Um, even within that, you still need a lot of general knowledge on like, you know, behavior change, like right? some basic psychology, like, you know, health sciences, but, you know, training, um, you know, fat loss, nutrition, you know, muscle hypertrophy, like physiology, anatomy, like you need so much like general knowledge, I think in personal training um, to be competent, um, but you can specialize in, each of those areas um, at the same time, um, which I think is, is I've only just sort of realized this now, which what makes the job really fucking hard. <laughs> and we have horrible tenure rates. What do you guys think about that? Any comments? Sometimes like the general competency in all things across the fitness domain and career success don't really line up sometimes. Like just thinking off the top of my head, um, Brett Contreras with the glute stuff, like Gab Fandaro with the gut health stuff, Eugene Tio with the biomechanics stuff. Like these people became known and built like very successful businesses, um, being sort of masters or experts in one very specific um, domain. And I feel though, if they tried to become competent in everything, I'm not saying they're incompetent in other areas, but I'm just saying, like we touching back on Sam's point, if they did try to spread themselves too thin and try and become an expert in in all sorts of things, um, then I just don't think they would have got anywhere near to the career success that they did get. Mm. I, but I do think. Um, sorry, Sam. That's right. I'll go, go fuck myself. Oh, you're gonna let me go? Then I'll unfuck myself. I did. Yeah, that I was, was nice. Thank you. You are a good guy. I was just gonna say. So with someone like, like what Jacob said, someone like Brett Contreras, who's like his niche is glutes, but there's no way like he he writes a training program for someone that's not all glutes, is it? Like he he's addressing other things yeah. in their training. Like he has to have a, a certain degree of competency. It's like it's at a point. It's like he went deep on it and then marketed the shit out of it really well. And he was probably <clears throat> somewhat, we'll call him a revolutionary, say for glute training, he's probably one of the few people that we actually know who's invented an exercise and can actually claim it um, with any degree of evidence to support it. So it's like for him, he's still, there's still a degree of competency, but I think. Other things whilst then. Yeah. Like, he he know he knows heaps about glutes, but that doesn't mean that there are people coaches out there. Like, there's other coaches in Australia. I'm not going to like name names, but they would promote themselves as like glute specialists. But it's like, I think anyone here could even get someone to grow glutes, like with even just the general knowledge of like training and you know how to hypertrophy a person. Would you not? Would you agree? Like, I don't think you need this yeah, super, 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 super specific. Career success. I'm not saying, like, who's the better coach. I'm just not talking specifically about what, like... Oh, yeah, he, the, fact that he spe- yeah the fact that he's right, specialized. Right, right. Yeah. Who is the best coach here? Who's the best coach here? This is important. <laughs> no, I think Danny put, Danny put his hands up because Danny wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was saying I was the best coach. That was his oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was joking as well. Just just so I don't offend anyone. Uh, you couldn't offend us. Uh, I, I do uh have have a point to make though as well. Uh I, I think um it's probably important for people at the early stage of their career not to kind of get mixed up by what we're saying to think that you need to pick a very specific niche before you even start learning stuff. And I think this is kind of what you might've been alluding to Jacob of, you do want a good foundational knowledge across many different domains because they end up being useful. And kind of think of analogy of like, I don't, 
GPP or even if you think of early specialization in sport tends to be problematic versus having uh, different um, sports that someone plays until a later age. And I think um, you could even draw analogies with being involved in research at an undergrad level. It's extremely broad. Maybe a master's becomes a bit more focused. A PhD is very focused. And then for someone who does is a postdoc, they may spend uh, or then goes on to become a professor. They spend uh, years maybe on a very, very tiny slither of a very specific area. And so I think to get to that point, you would never tell someone, hey, don't worry about all this other nutrition stuff. Only learn about this one specific amino acid or this particular enzyme, right? You, you kind of build up to that. And I think coaches should do the same, but it also then allows them to actually find uh, what that thing that they're probably best at or what they can help people most with is because it's hard to know that ahead of time until you uh, and I'd learn. recommend reading uh, um, Cal Newport's, uh, sorry, it's lagging. I keep sort of, I keep thinking that you finished it and then you keep talking. That's really annoying. I just want you to shut up, man. Let me talk. All right. So <laughs> uh, I, have you, uh, Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You, he basically challenges, you know, the feel good mantra of just follow your passion, uh, which ties into what Danny was talking about then, um, that it's probably a good idea to find areas where, through generalizing and learn, like learning about a lot of different things, trying a lot of different, um, you know, like areas of, you know, coaching and work with different people or reading different things um, that you figure out what you're good at and by pursuing uh, things that you're competent at and developing a skill set that um, you know fits you um, what you're capable of doing you'll become passionate about it and you'll because you're good at it and you're useful and valued um, and I think that's probably sound advice um, at least as, as far as I can tell. Agree. Should we move over into it was a good chat, Jackson? Anything you want to add? Because I know this was you sort of um, headed the topic. Is there anything you else you wanted to bring up and discuss, or should we move on to the questions? We'll do a rapid fire. Let's do some questions, man. Let's get them. Jackson's ready to go get a foot rub with Putu over in Bali, guys. So he's <laughs> um, he's got a busy schedule. He's got to uphold. All right. Um, where are we? Let me find it. I'm just trying to get rid of all the nudes Jackson sends me to get the questions that he was sent. There they are. All right, cool. So uh, question, favorite forms of conditioning, metabolic finishes. This was from Stevie Pex. Danny, you can answer this one first. It was uh, directed to you. I don't do any <laughs> metabolic <laughs> finishers or, or prescribe them. So I, I don't know. Self curls is as much as I'm going to get close to that. Uh, All right, no, Samuel, I do, go I do not tax myself in that way. Um, conditioning, some that are, it just depends, but I'll probably go with a sled or, or I can only say one. Now, I like the elliptical. I've been liking the elliptical of late for, you know, fucking just bang it out a couple of like sprints or something on it. Low impact. Looks so retarded doing sprints on the elliptical, though. Huh? Yeah, I know, but like, yeah, you do. doesn't look. Good. You're not going to pick low up in, low impact, though. You know, got to <laughs> save that joint health for the heavy lifting. <laughs> Say that again. What about you, Peacock? I said you're basically married now. You don't care how you look. No. <laughs> again, again, sloppy and uncoordinated on elliptical. <laughs> Jackson, what's your favorite form of conditioning? Metabolic finishes? Uh, I like sprint interval training. Um, a method of... On an elliptical. Uh, conditioning, I guess you could call it, that was investigated pretty recently uh, last year. Uh, it's where you do a six-second all-out sprint. So you can't do it on... Or you could do it on an elliptical, but it looked pretty retarded. Um, I like doing <laughs> a, a bike or a roller. Uh, so six-second all-out sprint, nine-second rest and repeat for 80 rounds. So it takes 20 minutes. And they compared that to uh, hey. moderate, they compared that to standard hit, um, like 30 on, 130 rest, and uh, steady state cardio for an hour. And the 20 minutes of sprint interval training was just as effective for 
building or improving cardiovascular fitness VO2 max and for fat loss. And it was a third of the time. So I like that. That's a whole, Look, that's I'm, a whole session, not just a finisher. That is the session. 20 minutes. How long do you finish go for? Mate, they've trained, they've already trained for 25 minutes. I don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, it depends, depends right, on the individual question. Direction. We're training different people. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna get some uh, quick ones here. Um, oh, we're probably gonna turn it. How to train hard as a female without losing your menstrual cycle? Danny's probably got the most experience. Yeah, I was gonna say, Danny, can um, that. just manage. Um, energy availability so if you do have a high training workload as this suggests and or is increasing um, in the near future um, make sure that you are fueling appropriately in terms of your overall caloric intake um, if someone is trying to do that whilst dieting then just making sure that's a um, mild deficit to decrease body weight at the rate you want um, but that you're not trying to add in a very high training workload with um, extremely low calories at least for extended period um, because once you get into those very le low levels of energy availability, um, yeah, loss of menstrual cycle is, is a relatively common uh, symptom or side effect of that. So yeah, ma basically just about managing energy intake appropriately. Um, and, and sometimes it may not be possible given on what someone is doing, but in most cases it should be. Jackson, anything you want to add? So, yeah, like if we're talking outside the domains of like the last 10 weeks of a contest prep, like I never see any issues that are training related as long as the nutrition side of things is dialed in correctly. So if you are running into issues, uh, it's not a problem. It's not an issue with training boards at all. It's just how you sort of eating outside of that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, all right. Do you think I'll see a difference? This is from Chompy T. I uh, love that handle. Do you think I'll see a difference in body comp upping protein from 150 to 200 grams a day, 80, 70 kilos, 13% body fat? What do we think? <laughs> if I think calories that, are the same, then no. Yeah. Is that so, Jackson? So is he like replacing protein with another macronutrient? Is calories staying the same? Well, he has he's just adding 15. It was, it was a 10 word. If he's, adding on top, well, if he's adding on top, his body, body composition is going to be worse. If it, let's say, is that like maintenance already? Depends. Mm, yeah, if calories are equivalent, then I suppose he might be asking, is there going to be a benefit from going from 150 to 200? And if, I don't if, if it's already over that, two grams per kilo yeah, of body weight. So, so, yeah, there's no benefit to doing it. So, even if uh, you're matching your calories, it's probably not going to be useful. Probably just uh, expensive carbohydrates at this point. Next one. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to get some of Jackson's. Um, here we go. Favorite sports outside of bodybuilding, Sam? Go. Golf. <laughs> it's not a sport. It's a game. I've told you this your whole life. It's a sport. It's a game. It is a sport. Jackson, you're great. Oh, well, if, I, if I have to choose a sport, my God. Can you come back to me? Well, yeah. help. Jackson, do you think golf is a sport? Side, side note. What's the definition of a sport that it involves I think training, it is a that there's competition? Like, what 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 definition of a sport is it? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, there's got to be a competitive nature. There's got to be yeah. some physical element, training, preparation. I don't I know. What? Okay. There you go. <laughs> I can't my see Sam anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam's answer stands. What's your favourite sport, Jack? Uh, boxing, boxing for me. That's nah, that's cool. a game, bro. Cool. Um, I get in the ring Danny, again. what's your favorite sport? Uh, say golf probably <laughs> soccer and MMA, I would say. And mine would oh, probably be tennis, actually. All right. Um, who out of the group is most likely to go to jail? <laughs> Clearly, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Although Jackson's in Bali right now. Yeah. 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 It has to be Jackson. He could run up the authorities. <laughs> Jackson's yeah, already Jackson trying to pay more for, like a for, a, for a bike. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Tell us about that. You've already engaged in criminal activity over there. I was the only, was the only person to travel from Jakarta to Bali during a nationwide travel ban. So, Jackson's so above the Jackson, law, clearly. Based on, uh, 
But, but yeah. funny enough, it was actually a police officer who accepted the money and took me through. There you go. <laughs> I, had a, I had a private plane. It was not a private plane, but I was the only person on the plane. It was awesome. That's unreal. What about the pilot? <laughs> right, well, uh, well, Sam is basically a lawyer, so you know he's probably the the goody two shoes in, in the group. All right. Um, let me. Um, another good one. What's here? We go. This is a good one. What's a deal breaker for you when dating a girl? Oh, be careful, Jack. <laughs> if, we'll if she smells like anything. If, if you can get a smell of her that is anything <laughs> other than perfume or to pleasant neutral, then yeah, then no body odor. <laughs> oh, dear I want lord, game over. I, I want no smells. Okay, okay, Danny. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I've never been this is there. the most thought all, all day. <laughs> I mean, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just take anyone that will accept me. Um, no, I, I think maybe I don't know someone that you know, doesn't. Uh, if you have very dissimilar sense of humor, it's very problematic. Particularly how I just make dry kind of comments that are just supposed to be sarcastic. But I mean, if you don't find them funny, you're kind of fucked. It's kind of so weird uh that or yeah or if you can't have conversation if there's yeah it's the worst yeah so oh and if they don't think golf's a sport absolute deal breaker <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, for me it would definitely be um not supporting uh what i wanted to do in life um, which was grow your hair also, out which is grow my hair out and grow a beard and lift weights um, as well as the second one would probably be similar to Danny, having conversation and uh, an interest in understanding each other. I'd say those two things for me. Um, all right, next question. It's real deep. Is real deep shit. I was trying to think of something funny, but I was like, I'm going to get in trouble if I say any of the things I want to we, say. We should just <laughs> do, so like, <laughs> we should exclusively just do Q and A's about like dating. Yeah. Just, just keep uploading them every week. <laughs> like, we're these gurus of dating. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll add my own question. We'll just add another question on dating. This will be great. Jackson, tell us about your worst dating experience ever. Oh. There's a new segment, Danny. <laughs> But the good thing for you, Danny, is you're not going to be here every. You're not going to be here every month now. So this is what you do. It's like the S S J S. What do you call S P S? You just drop a bomb. Yeah, S J S. Yeah. I'd say my like I haven't had too many bad ones, but I'd say one bad one was a Tinder date where like she looked banging in the photos, like on the Tinder profile. So we organized like go to the date, meet up. Went there and she just looked absolutely nothing like the photo. You, you got a ca catfish. Yeah, basically catfish. And it was just the most awkward situation because the whole time I was just thinking of like excuses. That Did I you roll with it? Believe. I sort of rolled with it, but at the same time, I was like, how the fuck do I get out of here as quick as possible? And like, I don't like being rude either. Like, even though I wasn't attracted to the girl, I didn't want to be rude to her. So I was like trying to fucking come out with these like wild solutions and I, I ended up getting out getting out of it in the end. But yeah, that was like a painful how did you get out? It was like mental torture. how did you get out? Well, we just like had a drink and then we we're gonna order food. And I just said, like, oh, I actually just ate um on food pool, so <laughs> let's just let's support the drink. And then I bowed out. <laughs> and she's like, Oh, but you told me we we're going out for dinner. You're like, yeah, bad timing. I already, I already told her what we're gonna eat. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> right, we'll move on. Um, best qualities of a coaching client. A coaching client. What's that? Uh, best qualities. Sure sense. Best qualities of a, of a coaching client. Of a client. Of a client. Best qualities. Best qualities of a client. Rapid fire. Go. Jack. Um, the ability to just deal with some pain and not fucking complain about it i'd say danny danny likes that answer mm, uh i think uh, from talking to our coaches being precise 
in their language and giving a well thought out response or check in um yeah. is probably most important seven i said just adhering like you know if we agree that we're doing something then just fucking do it for the love of god mm. mine would be honesty and that ties into other yeah. things like communication and all that kind of stuff. Cool. All right. We'll try and get um, a few more quick ones in. Any video games do you like, you guys like? Sam, you go first because you're a bit of a video game. X Look, video game. I u- used to be. Oh, video games. Like, I think Pokemon was always a classic. It was like, that was just such a fucking winning formula for a game. The fact that they just like religiously, they came out with this exact same game, changed the map, changed in Pokemon, and like people ate that shit up. And then after fucking like 20 years, they go, you know what? We're just going to remake the exact same old game and you're going to buy it. And we did. And then they just like released the same game that we bought 20 years ago and it's just different. And now everyone's doing it. It's fucking good. Pokemon. OG Pokemon though. Yep. Danny? That's No idea. You're asking the wrong person. Any game Jackson. that kill people. <laughs> I, I used to, I used to, they ain't games, man. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a big COD junkie back in the day, but like nowadays with the new, like the new release COD, like if you're not like basically on it, like playing from day dot and like playing a lot, um, in those early stages, you just get fucking roasted. Like everyone's playing it so much, and like I just don't have the time to be able to play it as much as these guys. You just get fucking hammered, and when you get hammered, it's it's not as fun, um, but yeah, I used to be used to be a cod man back in the day. I don't play much anymore. I just, my free time goes in anime. Mine would be Tony Hawk Pro Skater Man. That was that was a fucking game. Yeah. Pro Skater Two. How's it sound? Yeah. All right, I've got a question. Right. I think best, best console. Best console. Nintendo sixty four. Ooh, um, so I feel like there's going to be controversy. Danny? You don't know. Uh, no. Was your answer no, Nintendo 64, Jacob? All right, Danny, you're... My life has been devoid of any joy. <laughs> you're not seeing the theme here. Yeah. Last game you played was Snake on a Nokia. <laughs> Snake on a Nokia. Yeah. Those are the games. Um, my favorite console was probably the PS2. Because like at the time, it was just a... Would have just been a childhood related thing. Like I had to save money for it. I had to wait for my birthday. It was such a big upgrade from the PS1. And I didn't really have the Xbox wasn't a big thing then. So yeah, probably PS2 for me. And then I got out of it. So I grew grew up Jackson. You know? I I reckon you start watching cartoons and you know, you have family. PS1 was by far the best. That was nostalgic. Crash All Bandicoot. those games, like to- yeah, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Tony Hawk, the original. That was like Crash that Bandicoot. was fucking. That was a childhood. Is there oh. any other questions, Jacob? Take me back. Um, there are a couple. I'll do one last one because I know we've all got to go. All right. Um, um, fuck. Okay, who out of the group would die first in a horror movie? Danny's clearly not dying first, so it's out of us. Right? It's a trick question. Danny's actually a killer in the horror movie. <laughs> the twist. So he's not part of the group in the first place. Danny's a fucking killer at the end. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, I feel like... like I feel like... I think Jake... He's going like, to have the plan. He'll be in the background. I think Jacob, I think Jacob would die first. first. Jacob would be like think, late or something because he'd be the last person to fucking I think leave the room or something. The dark room, but not like this. <laughs> Sam would be like, guys, let's just settle down and think this through and like plan all. Yeah, and I'll Jacob be the boring like, protagonist. Oh, let's get Jacob out. <laughs> <laughs> what was you, you ready? So you you breaking up? It's lagging. Yeah. Do you think that you would out survive? You got me? Think that you would out survive Sam? Do I think I would? Yeah. I reckon I reckon Sam would probably die last. I think he'd be like the the but that's before Danny, because the twist is Danny's the killer. <laughs> yeah, Danny's the killer. 
So but at the end, I find out that Danny's the killer as he kills yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. No, he talks like... me out of it. He can negotiate. Out uh, <laughs> even better. And then I kill Danny. <laughs> All right, Sam, Sam is so good, he gets me to turn the gun on myself. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Watch as he bends Danny on himself. Danny just commits suicide. Oh. Yeah, he talks me into it. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys Danny thanks for the worst we hope you enjoyed time. uh the conversation that's it <laughs> yeah, it was just sam constantly feeding him uh brainwashing him um we will see you next time for another uh discussion and hopefully uh, you learned a lot as well thank you everyone <laughs> and we'll see you soon you'll do peace danny what? Do I, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't want to send. I don't want to send a message of peace to anyone. <laughs> I do not wish that. That would be so insincere.